Amen. Hi, I'm Michael. I'm the lead pastor here at Crossroads. Uh, I want to welcome you to our service. I want to give you a moment to just send out a virtual greeting. Just text someone in your faith community and let them know you miss them. You can't wait to see them again. You can't wait to gather with them. We're in the midst of planning out when that might be for us. It uh, looks like it might be sooner than later, so that's going to be a lot of fun. But also, as you're sending out those greetings, Maybe look for someone in your phone that doesn't belong to your faith community, but God is putting on your heart. Maybe someone that uh, doesn't even believe what you believe. and Send them a text. Let them know that you're in your church service, you're in your virtual church service, and you're thinking about them, and you'd love to pray for them if they have anything they'd like for you to pray for. Um, I think prayer is an incredibly powerful thing. It lets people know that we care about them. It keeps us in communion with God, and also is even more powerful when God answers those prayers. And so send out those greetings. I want to let you know we've been, uh, we've been exploring faith stories in the Bible. We've been doing a series that we call Faith Strong. And we're looking at stories that inspire our faith, stories that teach us about faith, stories that even challenge our faith. Because I think a lot of us want to have greater faith than we do. And, and if we don't, you should want to have greater faith than you do. We should trust God always, all the time, with everything. We should go after everything that He says, you do this. We should do it. But usually you and I are like, man, I I just, I don't know. I believe in you, God, but I don't know if I trust that this is going to work out. And so we've been looking at these stories, trying to bolster our faith, trying to figure out how do we grow in our faith. Well, one of the stories I want to look at is found in Mark chapter 2. You can turn there. It's also going to be up on the screen here. Um, it's a story about some guys bringing their friend to Jesus. And uh, I think it, it speaks volumes. There's so much to unpack here. We're going to be looking at this across the next couple of weeks. Um, but I want to share this story with you. First, would you join me in prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for what you have done for us. Um, thank you that you sent your son to be a sacrifice for us. And you are at work trying to heal us, Father, if we want to be healed. Father, bless this time as we open up these scriptures, as we read them and hear them and and try and unpack them. Help us to hear what they're saying to us in our context. Father, for those of us who may have never heard this kind of thing or never heard the gospel that you love us and that you are willing to forgive us and heal us, help us especially, Father, to have open hearts to hear you and receive what you're trying to give us. Bless this time, Father. We ask these things for your glory. And in Jesus' name, amen. So this particular account is found in Mark chapter 2. It's in one of what we call the Gospels. The Gospels are the first first four books of the New Testament. Um, They tell the story of Jesus' life and his ministry on the earth. We call them Gospels because the word gospel just means good news. And you say, well, why is it good news? Well, here is the Gospel in a nutshell. The Bible says that God made everything good, but at some point, and including you and I, and at some point you and I decided to kind of break away from that. We decided we wanted to do things our own way. And at that point we became broken. We became separated from God uh, and creation became separated from God. The world became a broken place to live. We became broken people. There's something uh, tragic that happens when creation is separated from God, when we're separated from God. And so the Bible says you're broken. Um, and, and you probably know that. It doesn't mean that you everything that you do is always evil or anything like that. It just means that you're broken. You probably do some things that you don't want to do or some things that you regret afterwards or some things that you think at one point you thought, I would never do this. But here you are doing those things. And the Bible, the way it accounts that is it says, well, you're broken. There's something inside you that's not right and it pushes you to make wrong decisions. God says, man, Number one, those wrong decisions have to be paid for. There has to be justice. Now, sometimes when we say that, people say, well, I don't believe in a God that, that has to have justice. I don't, I, you know, I believe in a God that just would, loves me so much he'd be willing to overlook all of those things. And in a sense, that's what he's saying. But think about this. We only generally don't want justice when it relates to us and the things that we've done wrong. Then we want people to overlook it and forgive us. With everything else, we're kind of like, man, that's not fair. Man, when is that person going to get theirs? They got out of prison early after they did this. When is the government going to fix that? When is God going to do this? We want justice. 
And God says, yeah, justice, the wrong things that have been done, they, they have to be answered. But instead of having you and I answer for it, he says, I'll allow you to have my son answer for it. I'll send my son, he'll live his life perfectly and he'll die on a cross. And he can be the sacrifice for you if you're willing to give him your life and begin to live uh, the way that God wants us to. That means your sins can be forgiven. Uh, we call that being saved. And it also means that God is at work healing you of the broken things inside you. That's the gospel in a nutshell. That's why it's good news. You and I, we can't fix ourselves. And I don't know about you, but there's things that I regret that I can't go back and change. Um, we can't make amends for the things we've done wrong. So God says, I'll do it. And that's good news. Well, Jesus is out and throughout his life, he's preaching this good news, right? And people come to him to learn from him. They come to him to be healed. And this is one of those stories. It says this in verse one. A few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people had heard that he had come home. They gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door, and he preached the word to them. That's the gospel. Some men came, bringing to him a paralyzed man carried by four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it and then lowered the, man, uh, lowered the mat the man was lying on. These are some good friends, right? When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, son, your sins are forgiven. Every time I read this account, and it's in three of the gospels, every time I read this, I always just chuckle a little bit because you've got to figure that the guy who's paralyzed is like, I made it. I'm in front of Jesus, the guy that's healing everybody, the guy that's teaching everything, the guy that's giving blind people sight, the guy that's making lame people walk, the guy that's making people that can't speak, speak, and people that can't hear, hear, and raising people from the dead. I did it. My friends brought me here, and now I'm in front of Jesus, and here I am. I'm going to be healed. And Jesus looks at him and sees him and says, your sins are forgiven. Does it ever seem to you like Jesus is just so out of touch with our reality? You know that guy's got to be like, wait, my what or what? I'm sorry, my what? Hold on, wait, what? Right? It's interesting. We're going to talk about that, but I'm going to wait to get there. But we'll, we'll get to that. It says, now some teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately, Jesus knew in his spirit that this is what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, why are you thinking these things? Which is easier, to say to this paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven? Or to say, get up, take your mat, and walk. But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins because it's incredibly important to us. So he said to the man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. He got up took his mat, and walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone, and they praised God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. So Jesus does this thing, and it's amazing as it ends. But in the middle of it, it's kind of an interesting story, right? His friends put him right in front of Jesus. Jesus looks down, he sees him, and he says, Son, your sins are forgiven. And I always imagine that the guy is like, what? My what are I? Uh, by the way, Jesus, uh, so there's this other thing, you know, maybe pointing to his legs or something like that, right? I have a dog that is really bad at pointing. His name is Oliver, and he just doesn't get pointing at all. I'll try and point things out to him and be like, hey, look, what's that over there? You know, maybe it's food on the ground, maybe it's a toy, maybe it's whatever, and I'm like, hey, What's that? What's that? And he gets the what's that part. He's like at attention. He's fired up. He'll sit. He's looking at me and he's like wiggling. He's like something's going on. He knows that, but he just doesn't get the pointing part. And I'm like pointing my finger, trying to point something out. And he's just, he's looking at me. Right? And I'm, I'm like, okay, it, no, my, I'm, point, look, right there. And I'll, I'll even take my finger. I'll put it right in front of my face. And I'm like, watch it, right? There, that's what I want you to see. And he's just, I look at him and he's just like, he's just looking at me. He doesn't follow my finger. And I sometimes think, 
you know, doesn't it feel like sometimes that God's just not good at the whole pointing thing? Like we go to God and we're pointing things out and we're like, God, this needs to be fixed and that needs to be fixed and God, will you fix this? And look at what's broken on me, God, can you fix this? And God is off doing his own thing. Son, your sins are forgiven. Sometimes I just feel like God is not good at the pointing thing, just like Oliver. But here's the reality. Jesus gives us what we need. We're pointing to what we want, but Jesus gives us what we need. He sees this guy, and it's not that he doesn't see that he's paralyzed. He's in a mat being lowered from the roof, right? He sees that, he takes it in, but Jesus gives him what he needs. And that's what God is doing in our lives. He's busy giving us what we need. And you and I would be wise not to lose sight of that behind what we want. We're often so discouraged because we feel like God doesn't see where we're pointing or he's not fixing where, he's point, where we're pointing. But God is at busy, God is at work, busy healing us where we need to be healed giving us sometimes not what we want, but what we need. I get it. To this paralyzed guy, he probably thought the greatest need that he had was to be able to walk again. And it probably tied into so many of his other needs. He probably thought, man, if I can walk again, then I don't have to beg. I can actually work. And if I can walk again, I can hold my children. And if I can walk again, I can, you know, and so many other things. And I think we see it that way. We're like, God, if you just fix this, so many other things will be fixed. And Jesus says to him, your sins are forgiven. Jesus looks down and he sees the thing that that paralyzed man needs the most. And he fixes that. God is doing the same work in our lives. Sometimes we're so discouraged and we're so put off because we feel like, God, you haven't answered my prayers. God, you're not looking where I'm pointing. And God is saying back to us, I think, I'm giving you the thing you need most. God is offering us forgiveness. God is offering us grace. God is offering us healing from the inside. Meanwhile, we're pointing at other things. And I want to tell you this morning, if you feel like God is not answering your prayers yet, don't be discouraged. Jesus gives you what you need sometimes before or in place of what you may want. I know we think, God, you're just not good at the pointing thing. I'm pointing and you just don't see it. It feels like we're pointing and God's not looking. But that brings me to my second thought. Maybe we're just not very good at pointing. You know, I was watching this sermon and uh, it was really good. I was watching a video of the sermon. It was by a, 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 you know, bigger, fat, famous pastor, cooler guy. And, and you know, when you get big churches and stuff, the, the pastors are always much cooler. They're much more fashionable. And so they, they dress like, you know, in the old days we were dressing suits or something to come to church. And now uh, to people, to them, to dress nice is not necessarily to dress in a suit, but it's to dress as something that looks nice now. And what I've noticed a lot of times for some of these really cool pastors, that includes a jacket. And I call it a fashion jacket because I think there's no reason for you to need a jacket while you're on stage preaching. It's not cold up there, right? Sometimes we're wearing a jacket, but it's not cold. And this pastor was. He was wearing a jacket, and, you know, it's, it was a sermon from, like, last week. So I'm thinking, like, it's not winter. It's not cold. And, in fact, all through the sermon, and it was a great sermon, all through the sermon, this pastor's pulling out this hanky and he's wiping himself down because he's sweating. And at different points in the sermon, you know, a- after a while, he stopped pulling out the hanky and he would just take a sleeve from his jacket and like wipe his forehead because he was sweating profusely, right? And I'm thinking to myself, take off the jacket, lose the jacket. He's wearing a t-shirt underneath a regular t-shirt and sometimes that's what he wears anyway, so no big deal. But the whole sermon, he doesn't take off the jacket. He's just sweating like crazy. And, and I think we're kind of like that sometimes. Like we, I thought that must have been his outfit. That's what he picked. That's what he wanted to look like. And he's like, no, look, this is, this is what I want to look like for today. And so I'm, I'm just going to go through it. And I, I think we're like that with God sometimes. We're like, we're pointing to things that we want to be fixed. Meanwhile, there's other things that we need to be fixed. But we're like, I'm, I'm unwilling to part with those things. This is how I want to do life. This is what I want to look like. 
Meanwhile, we're sweating and we've got to come up with all kinds of other ways to deal with that. Maybe it's not that God is not good at seeing where we're pointing. Maybe we're just not very good at pointing. Maybe we just point to the things that we want to be done and we point to the things that we think would make us look better or make us feel better. And meanwhile, God is working on the things that would simply make us better. It's an amazing thing. Some of us, we want to be healed, but we don't even know what we're sick of. Maybe I should say that a different way, because we know we're sick of plenty of things, right? We're like, I'm sick of this, I'm sick of this, I'm sick of you, I'm sick of that, blah, blah, blah. We want God to heal us. And we're telling God, here's where you need to work. Maybe we should let the one who can heal us also be the one who informs us. The one who tells us, this is what you need. I know we live in this age where even when you go to the doctor, you kind of tell them like, look, this is what's wrong with me. Here's what I want you to prescribe to me. And here's uh, what I'd like to do about this, right? But it is a crazy thought, right? None of us have gone to medical school or maybe you're a doctor and you're watching. You're like, well, I have. But the rest of us haven't gone to medical school and we don't know. We just know it's like, hey, I feel this way and I've got like a three different things. I've looked it up on Google and this is what I think I need, right? I think we go to God the same way. And we're like, God, this is what I want. This is what I need. And we're pointing at all these things and God's like, that doesn't matter at all. You don't need that at all. It's really not going to change anything at all. We're pointing these things. We're like, God, if, look, this is what I'm pointing at. I need more money. And God's like, man, if you get more money, you'll spend more money. God, I need that person to be with me. If you get that person, you'll just start following that person. God, I need a better neighborhood. God, I need a different career. God, I need this raise. God, I need, and we're pointing to all these things and God is saying, man, I got to tell you, I know what you need and I'm willing to give it to you. Maybe you and I should stop telling God how we need to be healed and simply ask him, God, will you heal me? Maybe we should stop asking God to heal us in specific ways and just ask God to heal us so that he can do the work that he does best. He says, your sins are forgiven. And here's what's kind of nice. Sometimes God does give us what we want. He says, your sins are forgiven. But then just a little while later, he says, go ahead, get up, take your mat and walk. He gives the paralyzed man what he wants. And sometimes that happens for us. Um, and it's always nice when it does. But sometimes it doesn't. I want you to know if you're sitting there and you're praying for things, keep praying. Sometimes God gives us what we want. But I think sometimes it's more important to just let God know. You know. You're the one in charge. You know where I'm broken. You know what needs to be fixed. You know what needs to be healed. You do your work. I'm just giving you my life and my trust. You do the doctor work. Sometimes he gives us what we want, and it's a blessing. And here's the last thing I would say about that. It says that when everybody saw it, they were amazed and they praised God. And here's the thing. When we do get what we want, our blessings should be his testimony. Our blessings should be his testimony. The things that happen to us sometimes, good things happen to us and we walk around, we're like, yep, I did that. I accomplished this. I went to school for this. I got this promotion. I wiggled my way through this. I, uh, I pursued that person and I got them. I captured them. I brought them in. And, and we want the glory for ourselves. We want to be famous. And God says, that doesn't do me any good. It doesn't do me any good if I do good things for you and then you take all the credit for them. It's not to say that you weren't a part of some of the things that happen in your life, for sure. But the Bible says that every good and perfect gift comes from God. That means that God is constantly working in your life to make things good, to make things better, to make you better. He's at work, and when He's doing that, He should get the credit. We should be people who are praising him and people who are testifying about him when good things happen to us and when things that we pray for, when they're answered. Our blessings should be his testimony. And if you're not using them that way, then I got to tell you something. 
there's probably a big chance you're not getting them. God says, man, the people that I can trust with little things, I can trust with big things. If I can trust you to testify about your blessings, if I can trust you to point people to me when you are blessed, then I can keep blessing you and the blessings can maybe get bigger and bigger. But if I can't trust you to testify about me when you're being blessed, there's no point in me blessing you. And then people will think it's you. And then if people think it's you, they think that they can do it themselves too. And they don't need me. God wants everybody to come to him because he wants everybody to be ultimately fixed, healed, forgiven. Listen, if that's you this morning, if you're sitting there and you're like, man, I, I, I get the gospel. I see the brokenness inside of me. I see the things that I've tried to heal and fix, but I can't. I have regrets and things that I know I've done wrong and there's nothing I can do about them. I can't make up for those things. And you hear God's offer saying, I would love to do that for you. My son came and died so that you could be forgiven, so that you could be healed, so that you could be in relationship with me again. And you want that? God is offering that to you this morning. It's really simple. We just... We give our, I say it's really simple. It's really simple to say. It's harder to do. We give our lives over to God. We say, Jesus, I give you my life. Take my life, my brokenness, my sins, the things that I've done wrong, my mistakes. Take them. Forgive me of those things. Heal me of my brokenness. And I will endeavor to live out a life where you're God, where I live the way that you say, living out a life of love and trying not to participate in the brokenness anymore, be part of the brokenness anymore. We begin a relationship with God that way. And you might have a relationship with God already. You just might not have ever surrendered your life to him. That's how we begin. We call it being born again. Our sins are forgiven. God begins a work in us, healing us of our brokenness. You can have that this morning just by making that a simple prayer. For the rest of us, maybe you're in a relationship with Jesus and you're walking along, but you find yourself in the position of this guy where it's like you feel like God's just not paying attention to where you're pointing. And I want to encourage you and tell you that God is working on where you need to be fixed, where you need to be healed. It's not always where we point but it's always where we need. It's tough to stop pointing, to stop telling God, this is what I need, this is what I want, but I want it so bad, it's got to be this thing, and this thing would fix so many other things. It's tough to just trust God with your life, to offer up our prayers and then let God do what God does. And so take some time and see how God might be speaking to you through these scriptures, what he might be saying to you, Um, how he wants you to respond, what areas you need to just let go of or what things you need to kind of stop pointing to. We're going to listen to one more song and it, it talks about this idea. It says, are you weary? Are you broken within? Are you worn out by your sin, by your mistakes? It's an invitation. It says, come to the altar. God is waiting there and he's not angry with you. In fact, his arms are open wide. He wants to forgive you. He wants you to be with him. He wants you to have life and happiness and joy and peace. You don't have to be afraid. And so maybe today during the song, maybe think about what you need to take to that altar. Maybe it's one of the things you're pointing at and you're like, I got to give this up. Maybe it's something you're not even pointing at. You're just like, God, I don't want you to see that. Heal this over here, but don't look over here. I don't know. But take some time during this song to think about what God might be saying to you through this message, through these scriptures, through the lyrics of this song, and think about what it means to come to the altar. God bless you guys. Thank you for joining us, and we'll see you next week.